we're just getting things started here. We'll be started any second now. Mostly waiting for web pages to render. Hooray, Mastodon front end. And of course, Twitter, which is a giant pile of garbage made of JavaScript. And here, is it going to work? So professional. stop us. I am Jeff Cliff. Uh, of course, the one person who's watching is well aware of this, but I just figure I will reiterate for future watchers on YouTube, etc. So uh, there is going to be a whole bunch of stuff again today that I'm going to hopefully try to get through. Um, and as usual, I have, uh, I don't, this particular song that I'm going to play is not strictly speaking Creative Commons. Uh, however, I think you're going to get the idea of its uh, distribution uh, and remixability uh, very quickly. Uh, so I'm going to cut into that pretty quick, but we'll see if the YouTube content ID sensor bots uh, take it down. Let's see if that happens. Association of America. Hello? Hello? Well, I recollect the days when music was free. You could take from the radio, burn the CD. Now the RIAA wants to know about me. My address, my number, my ISP. Yo, bitches, ain't we still got privacy? Why the president be letting you spy on me? How many tricks are gonna be letting you try on me? Trying to be spying on my MP3s. But you protect your corporate privacy. Keep your phone number hidden from the bourgeoisie. Your customers have to play hide and seek. So here's the number to call if you disagree. 
where we find the new songs on MP3. Embrace the new technology. Grogster, Kazaa, and P2P. So call this number now and help them see. And if you call from work, your call is free. 1-1-1 Carrie Sherman, well isn't this fun, it's Zug.com You know they've never been fair to the fans Now the RIAA takes a stand Can't believe we're getting preached to by the man So what's the plan, Stan? I've got a short attention span Well they gotta change up the industry Make it all available on MP3 Listen to people like you and me And make us wanna pay a monthly fee This song is not my lyrical catastrophe Go ahead and grab it, it's completely free Ain't gotta pay a dime to listen to me so share the song and fuck the industry. 775-0101-202-775-0101 Be sure to get the permission of your parents first. 1-0-1, we're 60 million strong. And of course, we're a lot stronger than that now. Uh, the internet was a little bit smaller when that song was recorded. Oh God, must have been 16 years ago or so now. Uh, but uh, the idea kind of holds. Uh, of course, the, the music industry has kind of changed a little bit. Uh, we do have uh, streaming music and the whole MP3s uh, thing, like everyone uses MP3s kind of in the background without knowing it. Uh, but uh, the industry has moved from that particular moral panic to the streaming moral panic to now that they're they're kind of accepting the streaming. Uh, if I read the IFPI's most recent uh, statistics on how much they're making, and most of the industry, the global music industry's uh, income right now, uh, at least as far as the record labels uh, are concerned, is coming from streaming services now. So they've actually been uh, they've taken the advice of Zog.com there. Uh, which, unfortunately, now that they've taken that advice, Zog.com doesn't exist anymore. They seem to have uh, disappeared into the nothingness in the long term. So uh, that, that, that's kind of an interesting little catchy tune I found uh, quite a while back. Uh, but uh, played it this week, figured I'd share it with you all. Well, let's see if this gets us censored. Uh, so uh, going, moving along, uh, I, there's a couple of things uh, that I've been slowly queuing up to talk about, uh, so let's kind of get into them. Uh, the first, of course, uh, is what? Well, what is what is this podcast again? Uh, this is an alternative to stuff like the RIA, an alternative to uh, things like Netflix. Time you are spent watching this and other alternative media is time you cannot be spent uh, or spending listening to uh, RIA slash Netflix slash etc. Uh, of course, you could have two streams going at the same time, but that would be rather confusing, and you wouldn't be getting the full advertising programming of uh, your, your other major media stream if you did that. So this would still be counted as a success in that case. So uh, the first thing I kind of want to talk about is the this concept of what to do when your uh, media source or your information source or... Uh, the thing you are finding out about is being censored. So what do you do if you find out that uh, someone on Twitter, for example, has been suspended or shadow banned, or uh, if somebody on Reddit has been shadow banned, or if some book has been burned in a book burning nearby you, uh, or if uh, you are, let's say, living in Iran and you find out that you're not allowed to read a certain religious work, or if you're uh, living in, you know, anywhere, and you're not allowed to read something, what should you probably do? Well, the first is you should uh, look at the consequences involved. Uh, so you should figure out if, for example, you could wind up in jail uh, or executed or crucified or uh, have any other something you know, really bad happen to you. Uh, and if that is the case, then you can, you know, think about the consequence. And if it is bad enough, well, 
you can weigh that that uh, that consequence uh, while you're thinking about the rest of this uh, because it's. It, you should be looking out for number one, right? You should try to keep yourself alive, keep your family alive. Uh, and if there are consequences to doing things like, for example, keeping a copy of a religious book or um, keeping a copy of a video on your own, then obviously, you know, do what you think is best. But if you have the option and if you think you can get away with it without being, for example, crucified or having your head cut off, uh, it is worth considering any time you have uh, an information source that is obviously being censored in front of you, that you can take that information source and have a copy of your own. And so if, if you can get it before it gets completely banned, great. Uh, if, you know, you can't and it's, it's banned by the time you get there, there's really not much you can do about it either way, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but for example, if you hear that, there's a secret number and this number uh, is being removed from all social media platforms that it is being posted on. If you go to the library, you're not allowed to get it. Uh, and then you find somebody who has a copy of this number. Maybe it's hidden in their website somewhere. In the, in the source code of their website, there's just this number. You're browsing the source code of that website and you see 09F9C26, whatever the rest of the number goes as. Um, you can take that number and copy it maybe put it onto paper, put it into a medium where it is currently not represented, uh, put it into a, a fabric, like you can weave numbers into fabric if you, you know, have the time and the, the skill to do so. There's millions of ways that you can take information from one place and put it into another. Sometimes you can do this in a way that it isn't obvious that it's there, so it's kind of like uh, either um, embedded within something or uh, there's an image. Sometimes you can put uh, data into images or images into text or text into music or music into math or math into uh, computer programs or computer programs into basically anything else. Uh, there's always a way to take information from one place and put it into another. Uh, in the 21st century, even in restrictive places, there's usually a way to do it. Uh, and there's a, usually a way to do it without getting caught. Uh, and it's worth talking with people about how you could move information from one place to another. This is something that's a little bit safer than having the dangerous information itself sometimes. Again, if you live in a place like Iran where you can get executed for certain things or uh, Dawa al-Islamia where you can get executed for certain things, then maybe you shouldn't, you know, toe the line too, too, too much. But here in Canada, we do still have a little bit of free freedom uh, to do this sort of thing, to do this kind of mischievous activity. Uh, you can take information and route around censorship. It is still possible to do that. And so, for example, if you have uh, a, a song that you're not allowed to put on YouTube, that, that would be an example of, you know, a, a censored work. What, what should you be doing at this point? If you have access to that song, you should put it on Vimeo or, or put it on the, the peer to peer nets or put it on archive.org if it is uh, allowed to do that. Uh, or et cetera. There's, there's always going to be another place that you can put something. Maybe you just have to bury it, right? You can take that, that banned work, that banned book, that thing that people are burning, just take a copy and put it off to the side where nobody can get at it for a while. Uh, bury it deep in the forest. Find a place where nobody's going to be able to get at it and maybe the, the politics will change. Maybe people will stop freaking out so much about it. Um, and it's, it's there, people freak out about all sorts of things. Uh, there's all kinds of bad works. So there's all kinds of bad, bad books. There's a bad book week. Uh, it, it's different depending whether you're in the United States or Canada. It's different um, for whatever reason. But it, it's just there are things that are banned. There are people that are banned. Right now, I'm finding that most of the people I'm hearing about banned on the Internet tend to be on the right side of the political spectrum. Uh, however, that hasn't always been the case. Uh, when I was younger, most of the people I would hear about being banned for various reasons tended to be on the left side of the political spectrum. And I would expect that as I get <laughs> closer to the end of my life, this will flip again. We will find a situation where the right is in control of this, this apparatus capable of banning people and enforcing conformity of thought, and we're going to get banned on the left again. It's going to happen. We should be ready for it when it does happen. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, take that garbage file from the Gibson, put it on your local computer, right? It, it, there is always a way to do it. Uh, now, we can get into tactics. We can get into the, 
the actual technology. We can get into, you know, what's the best way to write so that your, you know, the, the, the information on the piece of paper has the best chance of getting stored. Uh, Schnitz uh, in particular has these disks that are made of some kind of like stone material. So you can like burn into using just like a regular CD burner burning literally into stone so that you can save something uh, for thousands of years. It's worth doing. Find banned materials if you hear about them, if people are around you are talking about them, and one, talk about them, two, get your own copy and share it, and then you know continue from there. Uh, and, and again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, always keep mindful of your own personal safety, of your own personal access to things like the internet. Um, there are places in the world where you can get literally kicked off the internet if you have the wrong file, uh, or if you share the wrong file. It is a terrible thing that people have to kind of live under this kind of a regime. But we, this is something to keep in mind. So uh, I, I just want to kind of reiterate how important it is we, that we share information when we have it and that there is th these back channels available for people to have access to banned works because things you would not expect would be banned do get banned. Harry Potter is one of the books that is on the banned book uh, list. I, I have heard of places that have bad books. And in fact, not only have, has it been banned, but it's even in, in, in some cases been restricted by the author uh, herself uh, in terms of where you can read it and who can read it, et cetera. I won't get into the particulars there, but it's, it's just worth thinking about how widespread these, this, this tendency is for people to tr try to restrict what other people can see, what other people can read, what other people can think and hear the ideas that people can have access to. It's not, it is super common and it, I find it is becoming more common with time. Uh, so yeah, run around it, get a copy, have that copy yourself, share the copy as much as you can. Let's see if we can uh, keep a, this, this free exchange of information going uh, well into the 21st century. So enough about that for the moment. Uh, I wanna get into uh, another article here. Uh, this one is from quantamagazine.org. Uh, which uh, I have heard of before, although I haven't really gotten that much into it. Uh, so, you know, maybe take it with a little bit of grain of salt. Uh, the uh, kind of person at the top here, uh, it says that they're a senior writer slash editor, Natalie Wolchover, if I'm pronouncing that right. And it's a little bit of a longer article. I might skim it a little bit, but let, let's kind of go into it here. So, quote, on a 1987 voyage to the Antarctic, Paleocenographer James Kennett and his crew dropped anchor in the Weddell Sea, drilled into a seabed, and extracted a vertical cylinder of sediment, an inch thick layer of plankton fossils and other detritus, or detritus? Hmm. buried more than 500 feet deep, and they found a disturbing clue about the planet's path that could spell disaster for our future. Lower in the sediment core, fossils from 60 plankton species. But that thin, or in that thin cross section from about 56 million years ago, the number of species dropped to 17. And the plankton's oxygen and carbon isotope compositions had dramatically, or dramatically, or dramatically changed. Holy cow. Kenneth and his student, Lowell Scott, deduced from the anomalous isotopes that carbon dioxide had flooded the air, causing the ocean to rapidly acidify and then heat up in a process similar to what we were seeing today. While those 17 kinds of plankton we are seeing through the warming waters and settling on the Ar Antarctic seabed, a tepper-like creature died in what is now a Wyoming, depositing a tooth in a bright, lead, bright red layer of sedimentary rock coursing through the badlands of the Bighorn Basin. In 1992, the finder of that tooth fossil, Phil Greengrich, and collaborators Jim Zakos and Paul Koch, reported the same isotope anomalies in the enamel that Kenneth and Scott had presented in their ocean findings a year earlier. The prehistoric mammal had also been breathing CO2 flooded air. More data points surfaced in China, then Europe, then all over. A picture emerged of a brief, brief cataclysmic hot spell 56 million years ago, now known as the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, PETM. After heat trapping carbon leaked into the sky from an unknown source, the planet, which was already several degrees hotter than it is today, gained an additional six degrees. The ocean turned jacuzzi hot near the equator and experienced mass extinctions worldwide. On land, primitive monkeys, horses, and other early mammals marched northwards, following vegeta vegetation to higher latitudes. 
The mammals also miniaturized over generations as leaves became less nutritious in the car carbonaceous air. Violent storms ravaged the planet, and geological or the geological record indicates flash floods and protracted droughts. As Kennel put it, Earth was triggered and all hell broke loose. The PETM doesn't only provide a past example of CO2 dri driven climate change. Scientists say it also points to an unknown factor that is an outsized influence on Earth's climate. When the planet gets hot, it got really, really hot. Ancient warming episodes like the PETM were always far more extreme than the theoretical models of climate suggest they should have been. After accounting for differences in geography, ocean currents, and vegetation during these past episodes, paleoclimatologists find that something big appears to be missing from their models. An X factor whose wild swings leave no trace in the fossil record. Evidence is mounting in favor of the answer that experts have long suspected, but have only recently been capable of exploring in detail. It's quite clear at this point that the answer is clouds, says Matt Huber, a paleoclimate modeler at Purdue University. Clouds currently cover about two thirds of the planet at any moment, but computer simulations of clouds have begun to suggest that as the earth warms, clouds become scarcer, which pause. Uh, if you go back to the IPCC AR4, uh, again, this isn't the AR5, this is the AR4, uh, so it's a little dated, uh, but they do talk a little bit about this. Uh, they talk about how as uh, warming of the Earth happens, we can expect to see fewer and fewer clouds. They have an estimate of how much fewer clouds, and so that you can actually gauge uh, either, one, how accurate their model actually is, or two, how hot the world actually is getting. Uh, the, there is some uncertainty in their model, and there is some uncertainty in this relationship between clouds and temperature and the model. Uh, so it is wor worth being skeptical of where that the change comes from, uh, or if there is actually a change. But it's something that you can measure, and it's it's something that, that you can measure uh, compared to the recent past because we have pictures of the sky from ten years ago. We have pictures of the sky from 20 years ago. It is not something that is a hard thing to get. If you have a camera and you want to contribute to this understanding of how the, the, the climate works and how our understanding of this physical system works, you can actually get data points on this by just doing something as simple as taking a picture of the sky and taking where and when you took that picture and being consistent about it, right? Going back to the, the censorship thing, uh, this is the kind of data that was being meticulously scrubbed from the US government's <laughs> websites within like three years of you know today, right? The climate change data was removed. It was one of the things that was targeted because it was politically unpopular because the particular party that got into power in the United States and is still in power has this hang up about climate change data, even raw data, like never mind the, the, the theories behind it, never mind the, the explanations or the, the political incentives of the scientists or anything like that. It's just the raw data itself that we could use to understand how the world itself is working. That was removed. That was censored. That was exactly what was had to be saved by the effort of hundreds of scientists and data uh, enthusiasts or censorship resistors worldwide uh, in a massive project to keep it from being deleted and burned. Okay, going back, quote, with fewer white surfaces reflecting sunlight back to, back to space, the earth gets even warmer, leading to more cloud loss. This feedback loop causes warming to spiral out of control. For decades, rough calculations have suggested that cloud loss could significantly impact climate, but this concern remained speculative over, or until the last few years, when observations and simulations of clouds improved to the point where researchers could amass convincing evidence. Pause. Going back again uh, to the era four. This was a restrictive uh, part of their models at the time. Their, their computer models were limited compared to what is possible today and maybe what they are doing today as well. Uh, again, I haven't read the AR5, I haven't looked at the, the more recent models, and I didn't go that deep into the AR4's models, uh, but I did dig into them a little bit. Uh, so uh, this this is uh, kind of an um, important part to, to kind of notice here. And uh, now new findings reported today in the, new, in the journal Nature Geoscience, which uh, let's actually just check uh, to see if that is a uh, paywall uh, journal, because I believe it is, and it is, oh, maybe not, it's got a download PDF here, so let's see if we can actually download it, and oh, look at that, it is not paywalled, you can just go to this website, 
Uh, you can download the PDF and read it yourself, which um, it may be slightly technical. Climate science tends to be a little bit on the technical side, but if you've got a technical background and you understand uh, basic uh, statistics, that might be worth uh, your time. So anyway, uh, quote, the journal Nature Geoscience makes the case that the effects of cloud loss are dramatic enough to explain ancient warming episodes like PETM and to precipitate nature or future disaster. And then it talks a little bit about how they, they kind of came to that conclusion, which isn't all that important for the purpose of this episode. Uh, but let's say, da, 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 da. Uh, quote, a leading authority on atmospheric physics, Emmanuel called the findings very plausible, though, as he noted, scientists must now make an effort to independently replicate the work, i.e. this isn't set, you know, set in stone. This is only a uh, proposed, uh, although peer reviewed, suggestion of how our climate works. Again, you can help this by going outside, taking pictures of the sky, and not just today, like not just doing this right now, but doing it tomorrow, uh, maybe doing it every week, maybe doing it every month, uh, and just gradually noticing or, or, or having access to that data of what does the sky look like. Now, it's better to have more pictures of the sky in more areas. So for example, if you have access to a CubeSat, uh, which are not that expensive to get up in space, um, you could take a, literally take a picture of the whole uh, world going around and around and around uh, as a satellite uh, with a basically as a cell phone camera uh, with a little you know battery or whatever uh, to keep track of you know how much clouds there are in the atmosphere but it's it's not a hard thing to to measure and even if you don't know how to do the image processing to, to you know figure out is this pixel in this digital picture a, a part of a cloud or not like that's something that other people definitely can do this is this is well understood uh, image processing problem right here. So uh, you, you know, you can help get this data. Uh, we can test this, this hypothesis. We can test this paper as we kind of go forward, but uh, it is important that we do so. And it is important that we kind of keep aware of it because it is suggesting that we could have up to, uh, let's see, eight. Uh, so it says that we're basically expecting to get about four degrees or four degrees increase in global temperature caused by the CO2 and methane, et cetera, that we've already put in to the atmosphere. Uh, and I think this is on the, the order of um, by 2100 or so. Uh, but then they're suggesting that if we trigger this, this runaway effect of changing clouds to allow more sunlight into the, uh, to, to warm the earth and then not having it <laughs> kind of uh, reflect back, uh, if the, if this particular feedback uh, mechanism is triggered, it could add up to eight degrees Celsius on top of the global warming that we are currently expecting. So it would be eight plus four is about 12 degrees of global warming. So quote, to imagine 12 degrees of warming, think of crocodiles swimming in the Arctic and of scorched mostly lifeless equatorial regions during the PETM. If carbon emissions aren't curbed quickly enough and the tipping point is breached, that would be truly devastating climate change, said Caltech's Tapio Schneider, who performed the new simulation with Colleen Cole and Kyle Pressel. And so they talk a little bit more about clouds and the, the water droplets. Um, so the best case scenario is that we don't trigger this, uh, according to this article, is that we basically just stay under this, this runaway loss of clouds. And obviously the worst case is that it happens. And so it could happen fairly rapidly. It doesn't say exactly how rapidly, but it, fairly rapidly. And they have a cute little picture that kind of describes uh, a little bit more in detail. Is there anything else in here? And so th th they talk a little bit about on the the, the, the the computer model side where because clouds are generally smaller than five by five kilometers, and five by five kilometers is how small of a uh, kind of a sample they take at every point of the earth and then model that with the, the computer models. And so they have to do what's called parametrizing it, where it's just something outside the model that affects the model that isn't actually represented in the same way that they will do other kinds of temperature change. And so they have to kind of take that into account. Uh, let's see here. I think that's it for that one. Long story short, 12 degrees, 
a change would be immensely of a bad, it, it, a terrible, terrible thing. Like, uh, it, yes, it is still possible that in that scenario, humankind as a species could still exist by going to the North Pole and then, you know, living like, you know, Bedouins or something at the North Pole. Uh, but depending how quickly that this sort of thing happened, uh, it may be very uh, difficult to get wildlife and plant life to live up there. It is certainly not guaranteed that you could have uh, human, the human species survive a change of that magnitude. Uh, and so it is worth kind of keeping in mind that we can screw up our planet this badly. We can, um, if we mess with climate change, actually push it into this, this kind of a, uh, an equilibrium or, or something approx approximating an equilibrium. That a 12 degree is not unthinkable uh, at this point, at, at this junction in our history as a species. And so again, uh, you can go read the read this paper or read this article, read the, the journal art article that it kind of links to. Uh, but it, it's just worth pointing out that as these weekly protests are going on all across the world uh, with these young uh, children that are saying, oh yeah, within our lifetime, this is something that uh, is a real threat, is a real possibility, and that we should be, uh, you know, changing the things at a high level. Yes, the Canadian government just put in a carbon tax. That's going to help a little bit. Could it be, uh, you know, could we do more? Sure. And should we do more? Again, uh, what does the science say? Go look at the science. So uh, kind of enough about that particular article. It's, it's it's a very scary thing to think that, oh, hey, yeah, we could actually have a 12 degree change. Not within my life. This is probably, I, I'm probably not going to live for to see this happening. But the children who are younger than me right now, some of them will. And it's it's worth considering that. Okay, so while that's going on, finally, I'm <laughs> of, the, of the stories available here, uh, I finally get to the co-op strike in Saskatoon. Uh, the Saskatoon Co-op uh, has been out of work for months and months and months now, uh, trying to get a little bit of a fair deal. Now, you can always look at a strike and say, okay, well, you know, they're just trying to get more money or they're just trying to, you know, X, Y, and Z. Uh, but in this case, compared to pretty much all the other strikes I've encountered, uh, they are really standing up for the, the right thing. Uh, and what are they standing up for? What is the dispute? What is keeping this strike from ending? Uh, and part of it may, at this point, be <laughs> that the management may just wind up locking them out and keeping them locked out. We'll get into that perhaps in a little bit. But uh, the other part is that uh, there is a offer on the table that was given to this, this union, the UFCW 1400, uh, which was that uh, the current employees would continue to get paid whatever they're getting paid you know, might be a small raise, whatever the, the details are there, but that new employees will get paid less. And so that there would be a two-tier system uh, in, going forward so that new people who are hired uh, are paid less and then, you know, get less, I don't know if the, it impacts the benefits, but you can imagine that if they're, they're, they're trying to make it so that uh, the incentive is for the union to, to say yes, because it doesn't impact any of the current members. All it impacts is the future members, the future ability of that union to continue to exist, the future of employees at the co-op to make a living wage. That is the question. And so the union, um, the membership of the union had a vote. They put their foot down. Uh, they drew the line in the sand. They said, no, we are not gonna accept this. We'll go on strike. And the management said, okay, whatever. You know, let them go. They they went on on strike. They have since re-voted on the same uh, principle. They've 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 taken multiple votes to the the membership of this union uh, to say, hey, should we limit uh, what what's going on so that we can get back to work? Because keeping in mind, like this th this went all the way through the winter. There were people literally on the picket line in minus forty in Saskatoon, which in the middle of the prairie, there's like a crazy wind chill going on. And you have people who are exposed to the elements, just walking a line, trying to keep people from uh, you know, crossing that line going into, uh, and, and that's the other thing too. They didn't even really stop anyone. This is like one of the most peaceful and pacifistic uh, strikes I've, I've seen. They, they just like very friendly, uh, very sociable people. The people I went uh, to the, the particular line 
it, it, they had no problem with what was going on in terms of their customer. Their problem was entirely with this issue of uh, two tier uh, wages, and they wanted to to not in their you know basically not in their name would this happen. And they have been trying for months to keep this this from coming into effect. And they've even watered down a little bit on their stance to the point where I think that the the as of a month or two ago, they were even willing to accept a two tier system, but they're they they want to to at least after the, this this many months on the picket line to at least get something towards the effect of you know having a fair system in place. Um, but the co-op management refuses to even give them that. Uh, the the co-op management not only refuses to negotiate with their union. Uh, but they also refuse to negotiate with the members. Now, co-ops are set up as an alternative to uh, corporations, limited liability cor corporations, an alternative to other forms of human organization, uh, so that the membership of the co-op is the co-op. Uh, the board of managers that represents the, the co-op is supposed to do what their membership tells them. And they're supposed to uh, manage the organization so that it is in the members' benefit and in society's benefit around those members, so that there is a, a alternative to this greedy, uh, selfish um, model that is, for example, Walmart. Right? You, Walmart, you can probably go to, and and the, the co-op sells all all kinds of things. They have a grocery store, they have gas that you can buy. You got all kinds of equipment for farmers, uh, and so you could go to at least for the grocery store and the gas side cheaper alternatives than the co-op like it's uh, without question you if you want to buy something from a place that has slave wages you absolutely can go to walmart walmart is available if you want to buy gas from companies that go, don't give a shit about their community you can do that you can go to shell you can go to all the other alternatives they are there um yeah it's a little bit more inconvenient if you live in you know let's say fairhaven in saskatoon and you want to get gasoline and you you know may have to drive to the next uh what is it, Parkridge or something like that? I don't know if Parkridge has a gas station, but you know th there are gas stations around Saskatoon uh, that you don't have to go to the one in your neighborhood, but it is sometimes convenient to go to the one in your neighborhood. Now, in this case, the, the benefit here is that uh, you can expect that by going to the co-op, that you're supporting your community, that you're participating in your community in a way that isn't taking advantage of people all that much, right? It's, it's, it's a friendly thing to do. And so when the board of directors at co-op ignores and drops suggestions from their memberships to negotiate fairly, and when they don't negotiate fairly, they don't agree to this binding arbitration that would basically allow a neutral third party observer to come in and help manage the disagreement between them and their union. Like these things are, are suggesting that the co-op has broken down in Saskatoon. It is not living up to what it can be. So there, there's a big problem there, and this strike is showing that problem exists. And there's, there's, I've, I've encountered some people who are just plain not going to shop at co-op anymore because of this problem. That this has come out, not because of the the strike per se, but be, because the management is showing very clearly it is not responsive to the members anymore, and it's certainly not responsive to its employees. Now, so I, I wanted to kind of cover one article about this. Uh, that came up uh, this past uh, maybe week or so to me. Quote, uh, Saskatoon Co-op Board rejects resolution submitted ahead of annual meeting. Uh, so this is from the Saskatoon Star Phoenix. So take a little bit with a grain of salt. Uh, they tend to be anti-labor on this particular paper. Quote, an attempt by a group of Saskatoon Co-op members, i.e. the membership, uh, to exert more control over the organization's board of directors amid an ongoing labor dispute uh, appears to have been shut down. The grassroots group, which is unhappy with what it calls quote, the board's, quote, bunker mentality, unquote, last month submitted multiple proposals that it hoped would raise the cooperative's annual meeting, or would be raised at the annual meeting. So pause. So they sat on these recommendations for quite a while. Like a month is a long time during a, a strike um, to be sitting on these sorts of things. And so right away the fact that they didn't act on it like yes there is the the paperwork has to be there you have to go through the process that the, the exists for these kinds of disputes um but they 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 knew that this was going on and they knew that their membership was going to be pissed and they ignored it and they they just ignored their membership so anyway continuing 
The resolutions are aimed at making it easier for members to vote on directors, creating an education program about, quote, cooperative values, and beginning a performance review of the cooperative's chief executive officer. Uh, others call for a, quote, full financial, human, and reputational cost disclosure, or costing disclosure of the strike and the removal of the two-tier wage system for future negotiations with the striking union. So there's a whole spectrum of things being put on the table right now by the co-op membership. This isn't just purely, oh, give the union what they want and, you know, spend more money on the, 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 the new employees and fold like, you know, wet cloth or something like that. No, no, there are multiple suggestions being made here, including things like live up to the values that your co-op is supposed to be living up to, right? To look at the CEO's performance to see is, is he actually performing? Little things like that, that you'd think would be not really all that controversial, except in the case of a strike that is clearly not being engaged in in the members' interests, and that is losing the co-op millions of dollars that are probably not going to be recuperated, and that's going to probably make it harder for both the union to get what they want, a, a fairer system, and the company to continue to really exist. So, you know, and, and it goes on a little bit more about this, but long story short, it's, 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 a terrible thing that's going on right now in, in Saskatoon because you have the union that's actually sticking up for the future workers. Um, and these are going to be people who are predominantly young people. Uh, there's going to be, I'm going to guess that it's predominantly women that are going to be affected by this. Uh, and it's predominantly people who are on the lower end of the earning spectrum. Uh, so this is going to be the union basically sticking up for those three groups, trying to give them a better deal and the management trying to give them a worse deal. And yes, there is cause for, uh, you know, these, these kinds of disputes, these kinds of um, disagreements do happen in uh, labor negotiations in this, you know, it is part of how society works that we have to negotiate. And yes, it is possible that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the co-op shouldn't agree to this. And, but the way that they are going along doing this, uh, is a, it's terrible. And furthermore, the people who are crossing the line, uh, never mind to shop, but to work behind the picket line, uh, to in the jobs of UFCW 1400 workers while they're on strike, uh, I do not have the language to describe uh, how just uh, how bad of an act that is. Like, you are cr crossing the picket line, first of all, of a union that's protecting young, uh, more or less poor, uh, more or less mostly women workers, and keeping them from getting a, a fair deal, not, not a good deal, but a fair deal. And so you cross the picket line to, to accomplish this goal. Like, the, the, is, you know, how many puppies did you have to kick to, to, to work yourself up to the point where this sort of thing could be thinkable? It is, it is like, I, I went to the picket line. I saw the people crossing. I stared them in the eyes they crossed. And unfortunately, there was only one of me on that picket line because if there was more of me on that picket line, that picket line would not have allowed them through. But again, I'm not the one on strike here. I am just an individual who thinks that people who cross picket lines, um, well, I'll just leave that one for the imagination. But the, the end, end of the story here is that they, the, the UFCW 1400 is having a rough time right now. There are people who are crossing. There are customers who are crossing, and there are people working behind that picket line uh, who, are, who are crossing. And so the, it, is, it is a tragic thing to watch from an outsider's perspective because you see one group that is so clearly trying to, to make the world a better place and to do so in a way that is fair to not just them, not just the future, but also the management itself, right? And you have the management who are just not allowing this to happen. And so, you know, for those of us who are outside of Saskatoon, there's not much we can do. We can, you know, we can learn about it. We can spread uh, the fact that this, this strike is going on and that the issue is involved uh, with the people in our lives, perhaps if it makes sense to do so. But if you are in Saskatoon, uh, find the people who are crossing. Post their names. Find where they live find who they are, find their license plate numbers, right? 15 minutes a day, watch those picket lines and see who crosses. And maybe we'll, we'll figure something out 
uh, that we can do after that point. But right now, what is missing from this situation is information. The union does not have the information of all the people who are crossing. The people in the community don't have uh, the information that in this, in some cases, that it's really unacceptable to cross a picket line. One, two, that this particular picket line, there are people who are crossing. And so three, the people who are crossing this picket line should be socially ostracized. And I would even argue removed from the city, like literally physically removed. You know, if, if you find someone who's crossing that line, make put posters of them up. Like it is still legal to do that, right? And they should not have a, a way to, to be in that community without, uh, you know, if they're noticed, that, that should be an immediate like cause of, oh, hey, this guy has been crossing a picket line, right? Uh, if you go to work and you've been crossing a picket line, I don't think you should have that job anymore. I think you should be fucking fired, right? So that is the level we should be going to, is finding out who they are, finding out where they live, finding out their phone numbers, their driver's license, everything about them, posting it online, making it possible to socially ostracize them. So that is the, the mission for people in Saskatoon right now. And uh, that is pretty much it for today. And I will end this with a record uh, that I found kind of interesting here. Uh, in particular, it's interesting because it asks permission for people to listen to it. it, it it's, it's, it's bizarre that back in those days when this record was recorded, uh, that people would be so concerned about their, their, their private space, their home, that even the media in their life would require them <laughs> to give permission. So anyway, I'll play it. Hopefully it doesn't, again, get me banned off of fucking YouTube, but we'll see if it goes. So here we go. Hello, oh, Doctor. This is your recorded detail man speaking. What's new today? Something very important indeed, Doctor. And it's in the field of digestive enzyme supplementation. As you, of course, realize, there are numerous digestive difficulties that can be traced to quantitative or qualitative changes in digestive ferment production. Now, if such deficiencies are often intractable, Doctor, it is certainly not for the want of digestive enzyme preparations, because there are many of them available. The problem is rather one of supplying these enzymes in such a way as to ensure their individual protection and controlled liberation. Enzipan, the multivalent digestive enzyme compound, achieves just that. Enzipan contains first an outside layer of gastroactive enzymes, which dissolves in the stomach. The acid-resistant core will then pass intact into the intestines to release its enteroactive constituents there. Embedded particle by particle in a special medium, these enzymes are liberated slowly and evenly over a large area of the intestinal canal. Hence, Enzipan has three major advantages. One, Enzipan contains in two well-segregated groups the gastroactive and the enteroactive enzymes, while other products act in one of these structures only. Two, Enzipan's enteroactive core is truly impregnable to gastric juices, while 33 to 50 percent failure may be expected with enteric-coated pills, as revealed in a recent study published in Gastroenterology. Three, Enzipan releases its enzymes slowly over a large intestinal area, not all at once, as is the case with so many other enzyme products. Together with bile, Enzipan supplies all the important digestive enzymes, hence its name, Enzipan. What are the clinical uses of Enzipan? First, of course, outright enzyme deficiency with subsequent fat, protein, or carbohydrate indigestion. Next, Enzipan is successfully used in today's vast class of dyspepsias of functional or nervous origin. Also, Enzipan will help to intensify and physiologically regulate digestion in flatulent or fermentative dyspepsias, postprandial fullness, or epigastric distress of ill-defined etiology. And it will prove beneficial in the digestive upsets of the hurry and hustle type, as well as in those gobblers whose eating habits, both quantitatively and qualitatively, cannot be controlled. Finally, Enzipan is a valuable aid in special diets, convalescence, and post-operatively in GI surgery. And now a more personal word, Doctor. Coming to you under the guise of a phonograph record, I'm unable to reply to specific questions. However, if there are some doubtful points you'd like clarified, 
Why not try the Enzepan sample on your next pertinent case? In this way, some of your questions may be answered more directly and more conclusively, too. Uh, before you turn this record over, Doctor, may I thank you for the privilege of detailing you in the privacy of your home? I really hope you will enjoy the musical selection chosen for your pleasure and relaxation. This is your recorded detail man on this, my second visit to you. I hope I'm no longer a stranger. The last time I introduced Enzipan, the only multivalent digestive enzyme tablet to do away with unreliable enteric shell coating. Enzipan, the first and only high potency digestive tablet with sustained enzyme release mechanism. Now, this time I have for you another original development, Spasmacol the specific treatment for spastic constipation. Not constipation alone, not spasm alone, but the spastic type constipation. 28 years ago, Norgene offered to the medical world the very first Bassarin bulk laxative ever produced. Today, Norgene laboratories are leading in constipation therapy by presenting Spasmacol, which reflects recognition of spastic constipation as a clinical entity distinctly different from and far more common than atonic constipation. Spasmacol unites bacerin, the bland bulk producer with the highest swelling power among vegetable bulk substances, with bisgamma phenylpropylethylamine, a non-narcotic spasmolytic related to and twice as active as papaverine. By its bulk, spasmacol increases pressure while by its spasmolytic agent, it relaxes segments to accept the pressure elicited motions. Thus, peristalsis proceeds successfully beyond contracted areas, and specific relief from spastic constipation is obtained. Strictly a prescription item, spasmacol bids fair to remove laxation from deplorable self-treatment back to ethical channels right into the doctor's hands. One more good point. Spasmacol's spasmolytic body, in being a papaverine, not an atropine-related substance, is ultimately free from atropine bioeffects. Indeed, so valuable an advance in spasmolysis does this chemical body represent that we incorporated it alone in a plain spasmolytic tablet too. Plain, yes, but here's the twist. Since in smooth muscle spasmolysis, sustained effects are so highly desirable, we embedded half of it in the tablet's gastrosoluble, half in the enterosoluble segment. Remember Enzipan's construction? Thus, the first sustained action spasmolytic, Gamatran, came into being, which is my second presentation for today. Effective directly on the smooth muscle, Gamatran will relieve spasm, whether of neurogenic or myogenic origin. And through its timed release, Gamatran's spasmolytic effect is of longer duration and more stable intensity, a cardinal advantage, of course, in visceral spastic conditions such as peptic ulcer, Spastic colitis, spastic urinary and biliary colic, certain vasospastic conditions, and dysmenorrhea. I'm sorry, but your time is up. Oh, thank you, nurse. In leaving, may I quickly state that a sample of each preparation is available by mailing the enclosed card. May I also suggest that you keep in mind our trio of products. Spasmacol, the ethical specific treatment for spastic constipation. Gamatran the first sustained action spasmolytic, and, of course, Enzipan, the multivalent digestive enzyme tablet. Well, thank you, Doctor. I sincerely hope I'll be welcome again with a new message in the near future. Your recorded detail man.